Good evening. I'm Rachel Sachs, Senior Director of Education and Programs at the Cancer Support Community. Welcome to our live webinar today. For those of you joining us for the first time, let me tell you a little about the Cancer Support Community. For more than 40 years, we at the Cancer Support Community have been a relentless ally for anyone impacted by cancer. We help individuals manage the realities of this disruptive disease and get back to normal. Whether accessing our free services in person at one of our 190 locations, online, or via our toll-free helpline, you are getting a team of licensed professionals providing patient navigation, financial counseling, genetic counseling, pediatric support, and much more. Today, we're going to discuss the role of the oncology pharmacist. We partnered with the Hematology Oncology Pharmacy Association, also known as HOPA, to better understand the role of oncology pharmacists and why they are such an important role in the cancer care team. I'm extremely grateful to have with us today an oncology pharmacist and a patient who will help us understand the role and importance of the oncology pharmacist throughout the cancer experience. We're joined today by Catherine Redden and Dr. Amanda Sutton. Dr. Sutton has been an oncology pharmacist for 10 years and is a HOPA member, currently Hi. serving as an ambassador for the oncology pharmacy profession as a HOPA ambassador. She's a clinical pharmacy specialist in hematology and oncology at Dooley Health and Care, a community-based physician practice group in the Chicagoland suburbs of Illinois, and is an associate professor at Midwestern University Colleges of Pharmacy in Downers Grove, Illinois. She earned her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Pharmacy, where she also completed her first year pharmacy residency and a second year residency in adult oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She worked as a clinical pharmacy specialist in hematology, oncology, and cellular therapy at Rush University Medical Center for eight years. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Sutton. Catherine Redden's cancer journey started in August of 2019. She experienced tremendous pain in her abdomen, which took her to the ER in Berlin, Maryland, where a biopsy was performed. It resulted in a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, stage 3B. Catherine is currently in remission and continuing follow-up care with an oncologist. Catherine is a multimedia artist in acrylic painting, pastels, mixed media, photography, and gel printing. She is the artistic director of Lower Shore Performing Arts Company, providing live performing arts events, arts alive education programs for adults and children and public speaking, art forms, writing, and techniques for actors. Welcome, Catherine, and welcome, Amanda. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having me. We're grateful for the support of ASI and partnership with the Hematology Oncology Pharmacy Association and bringing you this webinar about the role of the oncology pharmacist. So let's get into it. Amanda, can you please start off by telling all of us what an oncology pharmacist is? Yes, so an oncology pharmacist is a pharmacist that is working in an area of oncology, whether that's working with uh, patients that have a solid tumor um, or patients that have uh, leukemia or lymphoma, and they may be working really in multiple different areas of pharmacy practice and how they could be impacting patients that have a cancer diagnosis. So it may not necessarily just be as you might see in a clinic, um, but there are oncology pharmacists really in a lot of different areas of practice. Okay. And can you explain to us what your role as an oncology pharmacist is on the care team? Yes. So, you know, my role specifically in oncology on the oncology care team is really working uh, a little behind the scenes. So I review all of the treatment plans that our oncologists place at my 
Dually Health and Care, uh, which is the community practice I'm at. I work on making sure new therapies are able to be obtained by patients. So getting that information on our formulary, as it's called. Um, so making sure patients have access to that therapy, um, educating providers as well as patients on the therapies that we're administering. Um, so these are just some of the things that I kind of do within the care team that I'm on right now. So you clearly play a very critical uh, role in the trajectory of a patient's experience. What other roles and settings can oncology pharmacists work in? Yes. So I had kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. We definitely think about having an oncology pharmacist at large academic medical centers, but like my site, which is a community-based infusion clinic, so your ambulatory care clinics, infusion centers, cancer centers, community hospitals, but we also see oncology pharmacists in pharmacy administration, on patient advocacy groups, or working in specialty pharmacies, as well as the pharmaceutical industry. You'll see oncology pharmacists really having a role in all of these settings. Perfect. So Catherine, tell us a little bit about what your experience was working with your oncology pharmacist, and how did you find your oncology pharmacist? I had a friend who was also my general physician. And when these things started to happen, she was affiliated at the hospital. I had privileges there. So she, when the pain started, she's like, get your husband, stuff you in the car. I know how you are, get up there right? and get it taken care of. And I didn't argue because it was really the worst pain I'd ever had in my life. Um, and that's how I ended up where I am. And they too, Atlantic General is a community hospital but regionally provide services for cancer care and treatment. Um, so I loved what Amanda was saying as an oncology pharmacist, that that's the dream physician description is what she talked about. And that has been my experience with my uh, pharmacist oncologist. She has been very positive from the beginning, not giving false hope. That's not the idea. The thing is we're going to help you and that was the same feeling as the entire team, my oncologist and the nursing staff. We are going to make this the best it can be. We're going to help you through this journey. So in the beginning, I had a team approach to this. So there was strong communication skills. Um, it was a partnership in my journey. I never felt alone that way. In fact, if every all my visits are now less because it is currently in remission, on the next week is a follow-up CT scan, see my surgeon and also my oncologist. They've always been aggressive that way. Time is of the essence for any medical issue, but cancer, I, I worry when I have friends who go into a different place or a place that they're just not acting like life is on the, the urge here. You know, there's life is fragile and its timing is important to get the right care. Um, she would take the time to get to know me. So she would, would get to come out of the um, office where she was or the lab. And we would talk about things. And prior to the treatment, what was going to happen, what I could expect um, and what my comprehension was. She wanted to assess that. And I could tell that she had read my um, comprehensive test results. And that was amazing um, to take that time. And so she became familiar with me in that respect. And that was really good. I appreciated that very much. I would say, I would think you would agree, Catherine, that oncology pharmacists are the unsung heroes. Yes. And they do so much behind the scenes. And they really play such a critical part in helping yes. manage your care, helping treat side effects, pain, et cetera. And it's really critical to get to know your oncology pharmacist from the get-go, wouldn't you Absolutely. say? Absolutely. And I'll echo something Amanda said, if I may, that she stays up on the current things. Not every place does that. So you need to be aware of where you are going. Uh, for ovarian cancer, um, Avastin is the tamoxifen of breast cancer, right? The Avastin is like that for maintenance meds. And so you don't have to stop at a certain number. It's what can that person's body, and Amanda, correct me if I'm wrong, can handle. Are the kidneys okay? 
Are they okay? Then press on to keep that cancer away. And it works very well. And, and that's one of the things I've talked with, even when we were on, uh, at Lobby Day on the Hill. Why aren't there protocols that seem to be similar if at one place uh, a c- oncologist is, di- is prescribing Avastin and the other is not? Um, if the other waits for another thing to show up and they use radiation instead of, maybe it's another round of chemo because cancer is sneaky and ovarian, very sneaky. And it could be in an, uh, one lymph node, but my oncologist pharmacist and the oncologist said, gird your loins, put on your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy ride, but we recommend another round of chemotherapy. And I went, do it now. I was just so at their, just, let's just do it. Um, so I, I really felt like they would, um, I'm going into the next question. I'll wait. <laughs> That's okay. I, we love your passion and clearly, um, you know, you're very empowered and you're a great advocate for yourself and really, you know, took everything um, uh, and, and we're, we're assertive about it, which is, which is exactly what we want. So right. Amanda, tell us a little bit about how oncology pharmacists help patients navigate the world of cancer treatment and medications. Yes, so Catherine has mentioned a little of this already and just what her oncology pharmacist has done for her. Um, But one, I think, very big thing that the oncology pharmacist is able to do is inform patients on the process that they, you know, are going to undergo as it relates to the therapy that they're going to receive. So which days, how many cycles, what that all means, but also what side effects they could anticipate or may experience. And they also help in managing those side effects. I always tell patients when I talk about nausea and vomiting, the worst thing you can do is wait until you're vomiting to tell us it's a problem that's too late. Tell me when you're nauseous. You know, catching it early is so important. And often I'll have, you know, sometimes providers say they're refractory. We've tried their nausea vomiting meds. We have to change therapy. And I take a little look and say, well, there's a few more things we can probably try first before we, you know, give up on a certain treatment. So I think the pharmacist, you know, really helps in managing side effects. There are also great resource to help you find resources that are credible. Now that Google is easy for us all, um, you know, a lot of people go on and use it and there really is information that is not correct out there. So asking your pharmacist, where can I find, I would like to look this information up. Where's the, the references? And HOPA has a really great patient education website. They have toolkits available for patients that, you know, have questions about chemotherapy-induced nausea, vomiting, our immunotherapy, which you see on TV even now, um, and they have a toolkit about that. Uh, There's also a real inpatient education um, in terms of the medications themselves, both IV medications and oral medications. When you look at some of the side effects, you'll have that information there. But another reference I really like for patients is chemocare.com, which is a site managed by the Cleveland Clinic. And they have really great, useful information and some ways to help manage some of the side effects too. So I think asking your pharmacist will help you find the a great place to find the credible information that will just be more, you know, empower you as the patient and the caregiver to ask those very important questions. Great. And Catherine, I think you touched upon, but feel free to elaborate how your pharmacist helped you through your treatment. But specifically, if you can share with all of us what side effects that you experienced during your cancer treatment. I love Amanda's proactiveness and I was experiencing the same thing. I did not have nausea. Now that may not happen every time, but that was because they gave me three different types, not even going to try to pronounce them, Amanda, you could do that. One was pre, one was during, one was, and it was, and they told me just for the first day, even if you don't feel, just take this. And I thought, well, if I don't feel sick, I want to take it. Then, hence, I was not sick. I didn't have to take it the next day for a reaction or the third day or the fourth day. It was fantastic. Um, and so they were always thinking about that and they would um, make sure I understood it. Uh, for pain management, 
if you, and I had pain, I still had pain for a long time. And it was take it as prescribed or well, it doesn't work, right? So you don't want to miss those pain pieces. Out. So you listen to that oncology pharmacist and you're, they know what they're saying. And, and that's what's so good about that because um, I would be, they would always let me know what I could be expecting. Um, Acetes. I had no idea. And they were telling me you, I was having some of that fluid retention issue that was prior to the surgery to remove tumor. Well, that was extremely painful and scary. Um, I did end up in an ER, um, which that would be the people to do the uh, triage for that. But once I knew what it was, the second time around, they were like, you're not waiting as long as you did last time. And, and that was my thing that I waited because I wasn't paying attention. The second time, right away, once it started, and that minimized pain and any other problem it would give me um, in my body and for really to make my chemotherapy treatment effective. So I really um, appreciate that. And what's the new things? As I said, you know, they would always stay ahead of that. I appreciated that. So Amanda, you know, some centers are smaller where it's easier to get access to all of your care team members. Some centers are much larger and it's more difficult. How, in, in terms of patients really wanting to manage their side effects before, know about them before treatment starts, how can they advocate for themselves to meet somebody, the oncology pharmacist like yourself? Great question. So asking your oncologist um, if they have an oncology pharmacist that you can talk to, uh, reaching out to some of the nursing staff too and asking them if they have an oncology pharmacist that they could discuss the side effects of their therapy or that they have any questions there's been plenty of times where a provider has, you know, approached me saying, I have a patient who I'm meeting with today. They had some questions. Do you mind stopping in? Um, and so it's very simple, you know, for me to jump in and answer whatever questions that they might have. It's even now with our electronic medical systems, sometimes I get requests forwarded to me so I can jump on the phone to call someone. I can send a message back through the electronic medical record. I'm so you know, really, I think asking the, the oncologist, the nurses that you're seeing, if there's someone available that you can talk to is really important. And I think that's the first step in finding that oncology pharmacist. So Amanda, financial barriers are such a huge concern for patients. Um, and sometimes it prevents them from being proactive about getting treatment. You know, the huge concern that they might not be able to work and how am I going to afford things? How can the oncology pharmacists help patients access financial assistance programs? Yes. So asking the pharmacist about some of... Uh, discussing this with them. We call it financial toxicity of cancer treatment because that's another side effect of it, right? Um, and it's it's a big one. So oftentimes the oncology pharmacist will know of options for financial assistance. And if they don't know of options you know, on the top of their head, they can at least get you to the people that do. So when I was new at my site at where I practice now, you know, I didn't necessarily know what programs and things were available, but I knew who I could ask or I would find out. I think one characteristic of many pharmacists is that, you know, once they have a question, they're bound to find the answer. So they're very determined. Um, so I think reaching out to your, your oncology pharmacist will help you find those programs. A lot of companies themselves have financial assistant programs and they can help you navigate that process, um, help with form completion if you need it. Uh, but there's also you know, other programs that are uh, available that are more on a grant funding. So especially at the beginning of the year, when new funding cycles start, there's usually, you know, more money in those uh, buckets to go around. So they, they often know about some other avenues that you could pursue um, outside of just the company itself. Perfect. And Catherine, can you tell us a little bit from the patient perspective, um, what you heard from other patients about some of those financial barriers that they experienced. Um, we, we too, where I am, and I know other places do, they have financial advisors, so to speak, and that's very helpful. Um, I also have an insurance um, benefit 
uh, counselor that I would talk to and say, is this covered, is that covered? And what are the percentages? There's a real drug parity issue of oral chemotherapy treatments and infusion treatments. The infusion treatment, they treat it as, oh, it's like a hospitalization, okay? That you really almost get the whole thing covered. I mean, one infusion for uh, the chemo I had was $25,000. Now you're getting that every three weeks. I, I just wanna, I didn't have to pay because of the insurance. I did go on a round of oral chemotherapies and I know other patients who had. That goes under your prescription plan and you have to meet a deductible and they don't cover them. So that $10,000, I won't name any brands, um, you are looking at a few thousand dollars, if not more a month for coverage. Who can do that? I mean, that's amazing. So we need a drug parity bill, something Congress, somebody sign it. It's not being funded by the government. It's insurance companies. Take a look, please. This is not equitable. And, and, uh, and that, when they talk about access, if somebody can have a drug delivered to their home that's covered, they will take it. I know pharmacists who have told me I have written the script for the oral chemo and they don't go get it. You're, you're not going to beat cancer if you can't take the medicine. So that we really need um, to be able to do that. I mean, we, we, we need some drug parity that way. But um, so that's what I also tell Pitt other as an advocate for others. You know, you have to be an advocate. You had mentioned that earlier, Rachel. You have to be your advocate to your life, your body. And if you can't do it, then you need to ask someone else. And it's not always a family member because they're wrapped up in this with you emotionally. So it maybe it's a friend and you have their approval to be with you at your at the doctor appointment. And they take that notebook with you that you have to have. I'm on my second binder, three ring binder, two inches thick, but I don't care because it's all there. And you're right, right? If it can't yeah. be a friend or a caregiver right. or a partner, there's right. the social workers and the care team and, and they want to be patients advocates. Yeah. They want to help and, and make it much easier so that patients can be compliant. So there's Absolutely. so many people out there. And I will stress, there's lots of organizations and advocacy organizations out there that have helplines. Um, we have a helpline, a cancer support community. I'm going to ask my coworkers to put that in the chat. Okay. Um, and we have uh, financial navigators. So mm -hmm. if anyone has concerns that's listening in or know of people, mm -hmm. there are many organizations out there that have resources that can help. And they have bilingual assistance. So Got nobody it. should hesitate to be able to get their help you know, and coming short of putting them in the car and you taking them, that that's what you have to do. You do it, right? We don't want anybody to go without treatment. Mm -hmm. Not at all. No one, no one wants to do that. There's not a person who doesn't want to treat someone. A hundred percent. That's what I do about the coverages. A hundred percent. So Amanda, what advice would you give to patients and their caregivers about how to identify and engage with their oncology pharmacy? So I think the easiest way is to just start asking questions. Um, again, we always, I had a oncologist um, who would always tell patients, um, you know, don't be shy. I want to hear about your problems. Every problem is important. Um, and that's why we're here. So if I don't know the side effect is happening, I can't help you manage it. I can't help your caregiver help you. So I think just being just brutally honest, tell us what you're feeling and, and what we can, and we will try our best to see if we can make you feel better. I mean, that is, that is why we're here. If a medication is too expensive, we have to know about it so that we can, again, help you find resources and ways so that you can get that medication or what other struggles or barriers. If it is transportation, transportation to your appointments, that's a huge thing as well. And that's where, again, social work often, our social workers play a huge role in getting patients, you know, parking vouchers, if you have to pay for parking um, or helping with Uber and taxi rides. Um, so there are services out there with 
at various institutions and various, you know, cancer centers that can help. But if we don't know, then it's, you know, we can't get that information to you. So I think really just reaching out to your oncology pharmacist, even when you're, you know, talking with someone, if it's oral, the medications you take by mouth, there's likely a pharmacist that is going to be calling you at some point to check in and see how you're doing. So make sure you're again, honest and asking questions um, and just telling us, you know, the information that you're feeling and what you're experiencing so that we can help. So this is a little bit off script. So um, forgive me, but I know both of you can answer this. So sometimes, um, you know, patients and, and you said, Catherine, you were encouraged to take that uh, nausea medication. And you're thinking, oh, I didn't have the nausea, but you listen and you took it and it prevented um, that nausea. Um, but sometimes um, patients are either reluctant to take certain medications because they're already on such a regimen, um, or they're on other medications before they started treatment, and they don't know what to take, or they say, you know what, I read this on Google, I'm going to take this. So tell us a little bit about um, Amanda and Catherine, Catherine, from your personal experience about that, and Amanda, from your professional experience about the to-dos and the not-to-dos? Well, why first not to do is you don't tell your oncologist or your oncologist pharmacist, I Googled this. Okay, so don't even go there. Um, I actually had a friend that I was working with and she was questioning so much, which was great, but then you want to also say, okay, so what will I do? If it's somebody who doesn't even like to take aspirin, well, life is different right now. If you don't take medication, cancer is going to ruin you, okay? It's going to win, you will not win. Um, and then, and I have to say, I know there's some people who do very holistic responses. That's really, I know they're out there too. So I don't wanna discredit that. But when cancer's in your body, I had a whole different thought about that and we're gonna fight it. I mean, and, and keep a sense of humor about it too, you know? They're wearing extra garb while I'm getting the radioactive attack, hazardous substance put in, but I'm a bag lady, just do it, you know, let's do it. But definitely um, to, to stay focused on what you need to get well. So ask the questions and then talk to the right people. That's who you have to ask, though, your oncologist and your oncologist pharmacist. Friends cannot help necessarily unless they are one. Um, but you need to talk to the professional. And that person's going to be the one to help you get your life back. And I would imagine, Catherine, that somebody else who's being treated for the same diagnosis that you are might experience very, very different side effects and, and things of that nature. So yes. you can't compare your experience necessarily to them. That's right. But if they say, I want to feel like you do, um, I do also say second opinions are very valuable and to make sure you're on the right path because you don't know, right? Some of the protocols seem very different at times, um, but um, the stand, the people that are doing all the right things at the right centers, they're all the, they're following the same types of things. So uh, you want to make sure you're not deviating from that. But you're right, you can't. I can infuse hope, positivity, being mindful, being intentional. That's how you have to be as a patient. And I know that's how my whole team was and is as they work with me. My oncologist pharmacist is always mindful about me. We even talk about books we've read. I mean, how, you know, and I'm not saying she sits there for a half an hour. That's not the point. But two minutes, three minutes, and getting to know your patient like that. They knew I was in a play. How's Mrs. Howell doing? I was in Gilligan's Island. You know, I mean, it was just, and between that, boy, if that doesn't help you get well, I don't know what does, right? But Amanda might, you can add more to that for me, but that's how I try to get people to approach the medication issue. Yeah, I think that the other thing I'll mention, which we I haven't really mentioned yet, um, is the relationship between the medications that you're taking and maybe other medications. Yeah. Or in the case of herbal medications, um, there certainly are some that interact with others. So right. if we don't know you're taking something, you know, I always would tell patients, just let us know if you're going to start taking a new supplement or you're going to, uh, your primary care doctor started you on a medication, because especially when it comes to the medications you take by mouth, the oral cancer treatment, 
Yes. There could be drug interactions. And so really that's another, I think, uh, area where you really do need to reach out to the oncology pharmacist or make sure your provider reaches out to their oncology pharmacist mm -hmm. to ensure there are not any drug interactions happening. And if you're interested in taking something new to make sure there's not an interaction with that. Um, so that's a kind of another area in which you have to really work with the pharmacist to help navigate so that you're ensuring you're getting the best treatment possible. And that's, I echo, that's huge. Yeah, I echo your comment about second opinions. I tell everyone that um, it never hurts. It always helps uh, because even if they're saying the same thing, you can say, great, I'm on the right path. And just because you get a second opinion does not mean you have to be treated there. If they're further away, you can certainly, you know, many oncologists will work with the, you know, expert. If you went and saw the expert in your particular right. cancer, they're more than happy to work with that person. And it gives you the peace of mind, which is something you need when you're, you know, you want to be confident that you're getting all of the information that you need to make a good decision about your health. A hundred percent. And we really encourage second opinions because ultimately, and Catherine, you can speak to this, you have got to be comfortable with your care team. Yes. You have got to feel that you can talk to them, that you can be real, you can be you, and that they are there for you. And some people just don't jive. That's in life. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, I, and you know, if an oncologist says, uh, you're getting a second opinion. You didn't ask me. Um, that's a red flag. Because what are they? Well, how are they going to be treating me through this whole time? This is a long time relationship. I mean, I'm five years out now, and I've known these people five years this year, and and it's been fantastic. But I can't imagine people who stay on board with people who cannot have an open conversation with you, and that's a big deal. I agree. So sometimes it doesn't click, Rachel. Absolutely. And it needs to. And so our listeners, to Amanda's point, always talk to your pharmacist about what other medications you're on. You know, you do that if you're going to your primary and you have to start a thyroid medication or any type of medication or going to your cardiologist because medications have interactions. And the pharmacist is, I, I do have a pharmacist who's my best friend and pharmacists are, should be our best friends. They want to help. Yes. I imagine, you know, um, Amanda, one of the real reasons you probably went into it is because you want to educate. Exactly. It's, it, you know, it's really, it's really fulfilling to be able to, you know, share all the knowledge that I have um, with my patients, but with my providers, with the nursing staff. Um, we we do love teaching. And Catherine's point she mentioned earlier, which is really the sign of a really great pharmacist, is that she ensured that Catherine knew the information and that she understood the information. I think it happens so frequently that we get in the habit of just going through all these are all the side effects because we run through all the side effects of cisplatin all the time. Um, but making sure the patient actually heard them and understood them. I, even in my training, I've sat through many appointments with patients as more of an observer when I was training. And a lot of times I would think at the end of them, I don't know that they understood that. Um, especially those first visits, um, you know, you really can't do any kind of teaching about any treatment within that first visit because there's just too much heavy information that you have to process and you just can't process that. So I think, you know, bringing in the pharmacist after you've had an, a couple of appointments and you're getting ready to start treatment is really a great time because you, you have more mental space and capacity at that point to learn and understand the information. And I always tell everyone, write things down, write down your questions, bring them back to me because I always think of questions the minute I walk out of the office. <laughs> so that's okay. You can run back in <laughs> or you can just save it for the next time right. um, because it's just hard. You can't remember everything all the time. So write everything down, keep it with you. I'm glad you have a huge three ring binder 
because yeah. that's helpful. Um, I go home and, and I think about it and I think, oh, what did that doctor say? I don't remember. Right. It's all a blur. So having someone available to write things down, answer questions is really important. And also take a tape recorder or, you know, your phone or something of that nature too, because as long as you have a means that you can listen to it again, that's really, really key and important. So one more thing I want to touch on is, and hopefully, and perhaps we have caregivers that are also listening. And for caregivers, and Catherine, maybe you can talk about your personal experience. It's really hard to see your loved one or your friend um, having side effects um, and them also having the opportunity to speak to the pharmacist to say, hey, in the middle of the night, what can I do? So how, what was your experience like um, with your caregiver, Catherine? And then Amanda, if you can touch on how we can empower and encourage our caregivers to know that you're also there for them. Uh, if your caregiver is your spouse, um, they, they see you every day. They know what happens at night. Uh, they might even say, you know, you didn't sleep at all last night. Do you remember that, you know, that type of thing um, or the pain? And, and really it changes their life too. You know, it impacts everyone. I have a son, it impacts them. You know, they don't want to see that. They want you well. They want, want things to be right. Um, but anyway, the, the main thing with the caregivers are your, your friend has asked you to be their caregiver make sure that they have permissions to be with you so that no HIPAA things are violated. Um, I don't know any oncologist or oncologist pharmacist who has denied a person to be with a patient. So that's a positive thing. Um, I, there are times, so you take that notebook, I will write things down for you. I was doing it for, I'm, I've done it whenever people ask so that I just, I'm listening. If I think of a question, I always wait till the very end and say, uh, would you like him to clarify what that infusion really is, what the port means, how it goes into your body, how it works? You know, and that, that always helps. Because um, like Amanda was saying, if you do it every day, you don't think about all the time, well, why, why wouldn't they know what a port is? You know, that type of thing. So it's very important. So, but you're empowered as a caregiver. If you have concerns, tell that person and talk about it before you go in and then always reinforce hope. And if you're praying people, you pray. If it's meditation, you meditate, whatever it is that you do and you get that person's mind right for that next step. Amanda? Yes, Rachel, I'm glad you brought up caregivers too because I think it's very important that as a caregiver, you also realize you too have access to that oncology pharmacist and they can help you manage side effects that you've noticed. So Catherine, I think a really great point you made is when people notice your sleep patterns have changed. There's many times where I talk to the patient and they say they're doing great. And then I look over at the family member and their face is not the same story. <laughs> so, you know, if, as a caregiver, you should be empowered to speak up. If you think something is not right, if someone is the person you are caring for, things really, they're not behaving the same way. Um, you're the first to know and you can speak up and you should feel empowered to, to do the same and to ask the questions. I also want to stress the importance as a caregiver to take care of yourself. Thank you. And know when there's times that you need, you need to take a break or do something for you. Um, it's, it's just very important. It's very easy to get wrapped up in caring for somebody else that you neglect to care for yourself. And that is not helpful for your family member, or whoever it is that you're caring for. So I know it's you know easier said than done, but as a caregiver and being the pharmacist, when I see this happening, we I always strongly encourage them to you know, there are ways that you can, you know, find some respite. There are places that assist with respite care. Um, so if that's something that, you know, you feel you need, reach out so that someone can help find those services for you and can at least just, you know, lessen the burden for you to, to do your own self-care. Self-care is important. And be open to that. And be open to that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And there's tons of support groups out there. There's tons of resources. And, you know, people having the exact same experience, um, somebody might be treated for something different, but caregiving, there's a lot of stress. And we want to honor all of our caregivers that are on this call today. And we have tons of resources at Cancer Support Community. And there's so many resources out there to support our caregivers. So just to our audience, now's a great time to put any questions that you might have in our Q&A tool. But before we open up the forum for questions, I have one more question for each of you. And thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. And truly, you're both huge advocates um, for patients and caregivers. And we couldn't thank you enough. What else do you want to make sure our viewers know about the role of the oncology pharmacist and Catherine, the oncology um, experience um, before we end today? I really learned a lot about this beast called cancer. Um, I also learned that it is okay to ask questions. There's no stupid question. There's nothing, anything you feel you are, as Amanda has been saying, tell me, tell them, make sure they know how you feel. Don't downplay anything. Um, if you have to take a little note on the pills you take and the amount in between, which is a good thing to do to keep you on track so you don't take too many um, with the amount of time, that's good. But I just felt like they, I learned that this is a team of people and that palliative care is more for pain management and social management, not sending you home for hospice in a way that becomes kind of daunting to someone because not everybody wants to think about that when they go into their initial treatment plan for cancer. But that, you know, that they are a part of you being cured. If they can't cure you, then they want you to feel the best you can to have a quality of life for whatever that time is. Nobody is God. They cannot tell you the amount of time you have. You just fill it and do it. And they're going to help you along with it. And I, I appreciate all of them. And Amanda, I, I just love your whole approach. It's such a winning uh, way in a positive way to be an oncologist pharmacist. I thank you for what you do. Thank you. I think the last little piece of information that I'll leave is that the oncology pharmacist is really there again, as Catherine's kind of mentioned as supportive, um, as a supportive person on your care team. So they have, they're able to ensure timely access of your medications to make sure that you're not, you know, having any side effects, managing those side effects if you are, because they will probably happen, right? That's more likely than not, um, that you will have some adverse effect. Uh, We're really there to listen and connect with with patients, with caregivers. Um, And then also, I think I really like, and so I will leave everyone with this, um, and Catherine mentioned it already, is to be an advocate for yourself. And if you can't be an advocate for yourself, find someone who will. Um, I think that is really so important. And um, oncology pharmacists are happy to be an advocate for you. And we are always advocating for you. Okay, so I think one of my coworkers is going to be coming on momentarily. Um, But before she does, um, Um, two two questions. And here she is. And then I'll ask these two questions that came in. Yes, so um, we have placed a on-screen poll you should see pop up on your screen here shortly for all of you joining us right now. Um, If you're able to take just a few moments to submit those questions for us, we greatly appreciate it so you can learn how this experience was for you um, listening to Catherine Amanda speak today about the oncology pharmacist. Great. So this is a great question that came in. Can an oncology pharmacist help me with managing my medications and any related side effects I experience even in survivorship? Great question. Absolutely. In fact, some places have survivorship clinics that you may be a part of in whoever sent this question. And oncology pharmacists often are in survivorship clinics um, and help manage those things. I think about even something like vaccinations. If you were interested in a vaccine, what is the information on the vaccine? Should I get this vaccine? That's a great question for your oncology pharmacist. 
and they know so much information as it relates to whatever your cancer was, the therapy you received, and we'll know the data on, you know, how this medicate this vaccine, you know, may or may not work. And if you need to wait before you get it, or if you should get it right away. Um, so yes, definitely reach out even in survivorship. That's a great time because they can also help, you know, make sure you're getting other routine screenings that are important in that setting as well. So that's an excellent place. Perfect. Um, and the other question that came in is, I'm an oncology health professional. I think we might have addressed it, but this is really a great point to just reinforce. And I would like to know when you would recommend placing a referral for a patient to meet with the pharmacist. Great question. And I would recommend placing a referral after you've met with your patient. Um, there's no, you know, no wrong time to reach out to an oncology pharmacist whenever you think, you know, you have questions or as a healthcare provider, a patient may benefit from that oncology pharmacist referral, you certainly should reach out. So there's, there's never a wrong time. And I would say in the infusion suite that I worked in, we definitely did that before the patient started treatment. They not only met with their nurse, but they met with the oncology pharmacist to understand these are the medications you're going on. These are the potential side effects. These are the medicines I'm going to help you um, with to prevent side effects and just started forming that relationship from the get-go. I think that's so, so critical. Wouldn't you agree, Catherine? Yes right away. Don't hesitate. Hey, life's on the line here. Keep moving. Get care. I mean, you know, if you get your diagnosis and then within 10 days, you've got a port and your first treatment, I say that's a win-win. And talk to these people and get it rolling. And they will take, guide you on the pace you need to be, though. I was ready to do it like the day I heard it. So get this out of me, you know. So. Got so it's it. a process. It's a process for sure. Well, we can't thank um, Amanda and Catherine enough from being so honest um, and taking your time this evening to explain the critical role of the oncology pharmacist and the critical role of the patient and your advocacy for yourself and for other patients, Catherine, is just so admirable. So thank you for what you do and my for new having mission. an elevated thank you. voice. <laughs> So thank you again to our speakers, Catherine and Amanda, for joining us today for this wonderful webinar. Thank you to our sponsor, ASI, and partner, HOPA, for their generous support of this event. This event has been recorded and will be made available on Cancer Support Community's webpage posted in the chat. So don't hesitate to re-listen to it, share it out to your friends, um, share it to people that you know are going through this experience. Thank you again for your attention, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.